Good morning again. I don't know about you, but that uh, the morning we've had so far has brought up so much for me. I'm almost ready to abandon what I was going to share and tell you all the stories that have arisen for me, and I'm assuming might be arising for you as well, where you can see yourselves in your life and your work and what was shared. But I'm going to instead actually uh, present our panel, which is the context for healing trauma, where we're going to try to address the question of what is trauma, who experiences it, what are its root causes, and some of the requirements for healing. That's a big task that so we'll just begin. And I'm going to begin by sharing a few thoughts with you. And we've been told that we can make up the time over lunch. So just letting you know that we can all take a deep breath together uh, and stay here together, that would be great. So the brain is a social organ and impacted greatly by childhood trauma and capable of healing. And I find that incredibly hopeful because the awareness of that in and of itself activates healing and can be a healing force. And the relationships, our relationships, with ourselves and each other, what we bring to them on purpose, is a central healing force for healing trauma. And I find that very hopeful because that relies on us. So as long as we believe in ourselves, and I do believe in us, to be awake, related, on purpose leaders in healing trauma in our own lives and in each other's lives and in this community. So for this panel, I'm going to scooch over here a minute, and the slides are up. Trauma is largely defined through the lens of adverse childhood experiences, or what some call ACEs. And you have a set of questions in your pamphlet related to that, that you may fill out and choose to share or reflect on for yourself. And ACEs can lead to trauma, where our brains and our bodies and our hearts and our minds can get stuck in the fear and the shame and the self-doubt that arise often in the presence of experiencing these adverse childhood experiences. Not always, but often. And let me just make sure I get, before I go to the data slides, I get my, my piece here. Okay. So these experiences can include physical and emotional abuse and neglect, which has already been discussed. Also, the day-to-day -day chronic stress resulting from struggling to get your basic needs met physically, clearly, but also the basic need for acceptance that Dr. Kozel spoke about so eloquently when we experience racial discrimination and other types of exclusion. Uh, this impacts us in a, in a very deep way as well. Other types of adverse childhood experiences include, of course, living in a home or in a community where violence is witnessed or experienced. And again, among those closest to us is where there's such a very big impact, where it's relational, and among those that we would presume we could trust, where we could feel safe. And feeling safe is the key. Whether someone on the outside thinks that you should have felt safe, could have felt safe, matters less than if you actually experienced that. And often, once experienced, ACEs are perpetuated on ourselves and others, and I ask why. So for children living in Baltimore, we're lucky to have some, uh, some data to share with you today that's also in your pamphlet. We estimate that over 56 percent have experienced one or more of the limited number of types of experiences um, we call ACEs, and 31 experience two or more, substantially higher than the state or nation at large. And this is all of us. While living in poverty certainly is a higher risk for experiencing adverse childhood experiences, the majority of children in Baltimore with two or more adverse childhood experiences do not live in poverty. Among children who experience ACEs, and after controlling for other predictive factors that we all know of, of course, age as well as um, even poverty in this case, we see markedly higher rates of chronic illnesses like ADHD, asthma, autism spectrum disorder, obesity, and even asthma, of course, and depression and anxiety, which you would predict. 
We also see that mother's health is associated with ACEs, as you would also predict. Nearly two-thirds of mothers of children who experience two or more ACEs are not in good health. This is a family issue, and this is an intergenerational issue, as already discussed. Children with two or more ACEs have nearly three times higher rates of grade repetition and poor engagement in school. We also see that when resilience and other positive health qualities are nurtured, these impacts are attenuated and potentially overcome. Miss school and school engagement, oops, hang on, I didn't put that slide in, but miss school and school engagement are much lower among children who've developed some aspect of resilience, even basic aspects of resilience, which we are learning more and more can be learned and need to be learned over and over and over as life inevitably continues and changes and brings on new stresses over time. Healing is ongoing. Yet despite the uh, innate and documented understanding of the importance of what we might think of as the new SES, social and emotional skills, such as resilience, optimism, sociability, and engagement in life that are so impacted by experiencing trauma, as can happen through adverse childhood experiences, these are often the least tended to in an explicit way in our homes, our schools, our communities, and in our organizations as well, and workplaces. And Dr. Kozel also spoke to a way to address this. As evidenced by this forum, though, we're lucky to live in a time when this is changing before our eyes, and ra quite rapidly. Of course, for adults, um, we actually have more data on adults in this country, and you won't be surprised that two-thirds report the experiencing adverse childhood experiences. And longitudinal studies are linking those experiences um, through lots of other controls that you might assume would predict it to um, a lot of chronic illnesses, poor health behaviors, and so on and so forth that are explaining uh, much of our um, epidemics of lifestyle-related diseases, mental health problems, high cost of care, and record high rates of suicide and unhappiness. We're coming to know a lot more about the mechanisms for this, and we're coming to know, and what we will learn more about today, is that to unlock the trance of trauma and the consistently observed enduring effect ACEs has it has a great deal to do with the neurologic, biologic, genetic, and psychological stress and impact resulting from becoming literally locked and stuck in the fear, shame, and self-doubt that can accompany and be engendered by ACEs. So perhaps the most promising thing is that child development and supporting children has a lot to do with adult development, as Dr. Kozel spoke about. To embrace the notion that this is true gives me a lot of hope. And if it's true that the body keeps the score on how trauma impacts us, perhaps it's also true that the compassion we need to have to open to the unempowered identities, diminish social and emotional skills, and unhealthy choices that can result from childhood trauma can be a great equalizer. And unfortunately, the free market is not good at distributing um, compassion needed to legitimize the suffering of uh, from childhood adversity. Uh, but I believe that if this compassion, if we can find a way to freely distribute it in all cases, and not just when our diagnostic systems are, uh, are legitimizing it, we can transform the shame of what is wrong with you to the dignity of what happened to you and find our way back to the wholeness and connection we require and deserve and are built for, regardless of our age or who we are. So the brain is a social organ, and this is good news. And as such, it's only fitting that we have with us today Dr. James Garbarino, a psychologist and expert in children and violence from Loyola University of Chicago, and Dr. James Hudziak, a child psychiatrist and scientist across a range of disciplines. Dr. James Hudziak is from the University of Vermont, and his focus also addresses the many pathways linking health and childhood trauma. So please welcome me in. Um, their presentations, and they will come up sequentially without further interruption. So, so we have uh, two gym presentations, Garbarino and the other guy.
The German poet Goethe once wrote, now of course he wrote it in German, but I'll translate for you. He wrote, what is most difficult, that which you think is easiest, to see what is before your eyes? What is most difficult, that which you think is easiest, to see what is before your eyes? I start with that because although we've had a, a generation of public awareness about trauma, it's still true that people are unable, are reluctant, are unprepared to really see how fundamental trauma is to the human experience. I want to give you a couple examples. Um, I have a new book that's just come out called Listening to Killers. And a couple of weeks from now, I'm supposed to do a lecture uh, to a big group in Chicago. And the organizer said, We're, uh, we want to have a book signing. Uh, um, and I said, well, you know, what about having uh, listening to killers? He said, well, no, no, the, the focus of the, the meeting is trauma. <laughs> and I was a bit perplexed. I said, do you know anything about the lives of killers? You know, you've seen these ACE scores. Um, for the last 20 years, I've worked as a psychological expert witness in murder trials. And it is rare that I interview somebody who's been involved in a murder, who has an ACE score less than 8 or 9 or 10. In fact, one of the things I've come to see is that the best first hypothesis in thinking about killers, it's not always true, it's not true everywhere for everyone, is to think that what you're looking at is really an untreated traumatized child who inhabits and controls a scary man. Most killers are men, 90% are men. Why is, that, why is that untreated, traumatized child controlling that big, scary man so dangerous? Well, for one thing, you look at the work of Richard Trombley, who asked the question, at what age are, children, are human beings most aggressive? And, you know, when you ask this in a public opinion survey, people say adolescence. But the actual answer is early childhood. He finds that among 20-month-old uh, children, 90% of the boys, 80% of the girls engage in very specific aggressive behaviors. They punch, they kick, they bite, they poke, they hit. He makes the point by saying, we don't see this because they're so little and powerless. He says, but what would happen if every toddler went to bed tonight and tomorrow morning woke up and was six foot four and weighed 220 pounds? He says, what would happen is by dinner time tomorrow night, most American parents and early childhood educators would be maimed or dead. This is why it is so fundamentally dangerous to have six foot four, 220 pound men who are actually being driven by untreated traumatized child who inhabit them. And understanding that alone is transformative for the criminal justice system, for the penal system, to see that you're looking at children. I was interviewing a guy in Mississippi a few years ago. This guy was so scary. I mean, he was on death row already. He had a new trial because he had killed somebody in prison. He was so scary that when he appears in court, they have six correction officers in the courtroom because they're afraid he's going to explode in a violent outburst. At the end of the interview, this big, scary man with the typical prison muscles and the prison tattoos, and I said, is there something you could tell me about yourself that would surprise people to hear? He thought for a minute. He said, yeah. He said, I cry myself to sleep every night. And I was able to find in the records that he does. And he's been doing this since he was incarcerated at age 15. He's a big, scary man, and he's an untreated, traumatized child who inhabits and controls that man. That's one whole sort of Goethe moment. It's right there in front of us, but we can't see it because we think of killers as monsters. We see killers as the ultimate other. And it is very scary to think that killers are not the ultimate other. They are us, too. Another example, in Cambodia, uh, I was visiting a program there for girls who had been uh, forced into child prostitution, child sex trafficking. And this organization had a long record of rescuing these children. They would rescue them, bring them to a safe place, keep them there, feed them, you know, treat their illnesses, teach them how to sew, and send them back to their home villages. And they were finding that within seven months, 90% of those girls were back in the brothels. So along came someone who said, you know, you're cleaning them up, you're giving them a skill, but you're not dealing with something fundamental, that these are traumatized children. 
the sex trade almost inevitably is traumatizing for children. And so when they reorganized their program and introduced an element of trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy, it transformed the outcome. Because not only were these girls traumatized in a sort of narrow psychological way, they were sort of traumatized culturally and socially because the message they had internalized was that they were garbage and didn't deserve anything better than they were getting. And until they could get inside their head and reorganize that message, all the sewing lessons in the world were not going to make a difference. But they did that. And now their success rate went from 10% to 90%. 90% of the girls don't go back into the brothels because they dealt with their trauma. So trauma is a term that is, as a floats around in all of our consciousness a great deal. One, one very powerful definition is coming face to face with human vulnerability in the natural world or with the capacity for evil in human nature. This is why tornadoes can be traumatic. But it's also why acts of violence and betrayal and abandonment and abuse are traumatic because they cause you to come face to face with the capacity for evil in human nature. A number of years ago when I was at Cornell, we did a, a video about child abuse prevention. And in the course of the video, we interviewed a teacher who, out of the blue, described her childhood in these terms. She said, when I was a little girl, my mama used to beat me. And one day while she and my mama was out at work, somebody called the police and the police came to my house and they interviewed me. And they said, is your mama beating you? And I said, no. And the police went away. And then looking in the camera, she says, and then my mama came home. And she said, I heard the police were here today. And I said, yes, mom. And she said, did they ask you if I beat you? And she said, yes, mom. Did you tell the police I beat you? She said, no, mom. Why didn't you tell the police that I beat you? And she looked her mother in the eye and said, because you could kill me. For a child to know that your mother could kill you, not as some fantasy, but as a realistic possibility, that's one of the dimensions of coming face to face with something that is fundamentally traumatic. Now, there are more technical definitions. One that I think is a particularly good developed by a psychiatrist named Lenore Terre is that trauma is the simultaneous experience of overwhelming arousal coupled with overwhelming negative cognitions. The overwhelming arousal part is that your sensory experience sort of blows your circuits. What you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're hearing is just too much to process and it sort of overcomes you. But that in itself is not traumatic. What makes it traumatic is coupling that with the idea of what is happening. That it's not just that you're afraid, but that you're afraid of the overturning of positive social and psychological reality in your life overwhelming negative cognitions. You know, when I went to Cambodia many, many years ago, we visited a place where 20,000 people had been massacred as part of a regime called the Khmer Rouge. If you're old enough, you may remember a film called The Killing Fields. An area not much bigger than this room, 20,000 people. And it had happened a couple of years earlier, but the, the cognitive information was there. Little signs said how many bodies were found. It was raining that day, and the rain was uncovering a leg bone. In the middle was a tower of skulls to commemorate those who'd been killed. And as if you needed any more information, they showed how this oak tree over here was used to kill babies. They would take them by their feet and swing their head against the tree. Some people gasp when they hear that. That is a negative, overwhelming social cognition, to know that happened. Now, you're not smelling it, you're not seeing it, you're not hearing it, but just knowing it is one half of the traumatic equation. Now, others have elaborated the definition of trauma still further. One that I find particularly interesting is a sort of direct challenge to what we mostly think we know about trauma. If people know anything about trauma, they, they know PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. How many people have heard of that, for example? Well, gosh, pretty much everybody. A woman named Bonnie Burstow has sort of offered a critique about that, which I think is very important. She says that to call it post-traumatic stress disorder is in a sense fundamentally disrespectful to the human process. This is what she says about trauma. She says, people who are not traumatized maintain the illusion of safety moment to moment 
By editing out such facts as the pervasiveness of war, the subjugation of women and children, everyday racist violence, religious intolerance, the frequency and unpredictability of natural disasters, the ever-present threat of sickness, death, and so on. I thought of this uh, back after the Columbine school shooting. I was at a meeting in Cleveland. And if you remember, Columbine, it was a, basically a white school in a suburban neighborhood. Two boys came in and made war against their school. It's really, to my mind, an act of terrorism against their school. You may not even remember that part of their plan, their twisted plan, this is 1999, was to hijack an airliner and fly it into the World Trade Center, which, of course, some other deluded people did a couple of years later. But in the wake of that happening, you know, there was amazing awareness of trauma in America. In fact, there was the first White House summit on youth violence. I was invited and participated. But you know, in that meeting in Cleveland, an African-American social worker stood up and said, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. He said, but we have lived with this kind of war for decades. And while I don't wish it upon you, I hope that it leads to an appreciation on your part for the centrality of violent trauma in our lives. Other speakers have referred to that. I'm sure still others will refer to it again. So Bonnie Burstow says that it's not so much that there's a disorder, and it's not that African Americans living in inner city Chicago or Cleveland or Baltimore are disordered. They are being asked to develop in response to something, what she calls this opening your eyes to what is there, and that the illusion of safety, which middle-class white America typically maintains, is not an illusion they could afford to have. I think it's a good reason to change the meaning of that D in post-traumatic stress disorder. I think we should really call it post-traumatic stress development. Because what really matters, what do you do with it? How does it affect you individually? How does your culture incorporate and respond to it? When I would visit early childhood centers in Chicago uh, 20 years ago at the worst of the outbreak of community violence, you would go into center after center and see young children playing a game they called funeral, where they would go to the block corner and they would make coffins out of blocks and take turns being the dead child and the grieving parents and the preacher and the mourners. And this wasn't some disorder. This was children using the cultural t tools they have, which is play, to try to make sense of their experience. They really were engaging in post-traumatic stress development. I was interviewing a guy recently. I, I asked him, when was the first time you witnessed a shooting? He said, I was eight years old. I said, if we took 100 children at random from America and asked them, you, okay, eight-year-olds, have you witnessed a shooting? I said, how many of that hundred do you think would have witnessed a shooting? He said, 60 or 70. And when I told him that the data showed the number is something more like three or four, he was flabbergasted because he realized what had become normal in his environment to live with and adapt with was actually very unusual. I was talking with a boy recently who said, he said, you know, it wasn't until I was 14 years old that I ever met anybody who had a father who lived with him. That this is devastating, not in a pathological sense, but in a human challenge. And a couple of other researchers have taken this a step further. They talk about three different kinds of trauma. One is a single incident of trauma, probably the most common, a bad day. Columbine High School in April of 1999, a really bad day. They talk about type 2 trauma, which is repeated multiple incidents of trauma. Now, this is an important distinction in part because a single incident of trauma lends itself very naturally to kind of psychological first aid and what might be called the therapy of reassurance. It's okay. Things are back to normal. But if you live in an environment where there is multiple incidents of trauma, the therapy of reassurance seems preposterous. You can't say reassuringly, it's okay, things are back to normal, because you know even at eight or seven or six, there was a shooting here two months ago, and odds are there'll be another one next month. So the resources we have to bring to bear aren't the simple, simplistic resources of reassurance. You know, the research shows that one incident of trauma, like 9-11, if you live in lower Manhattan, 
or Columbine High School, come back in a year, and 85, 90 percent of the kids are basically back to where they were, because this is an aberration. In Bonnie Burstyn's term, they've seen what can happen, and they may be changed by it, but functionally they know that it was an exception to the rule. But live in a multiply traumatizing environment, you have to reorganize your understanding of the world. You have to adapt to it. And often those adaptations are functional in that world, but set you apart and give you almost a disability outside that world. Because you don't trust adults, because they can't deliver. Because you don't trust other people, because you don't know who the next perpetrator will be. But even that isn't the whole story. These researchers, Catherine Heidi and Barbara Solomon, talk about type 3 trauma, which is pervasive, severe trauma throughout early childhood. This is your living in an abusive home while set within a, a violent community. This is trauma that occurs pervasively and prolonged over the first thousand days of life, the first two thousand days of life, when all the building blocks of human development are being created and assembled, when these brains that we're talking about are being created and assembled. Now I just want to close in a sense because I know we have very limited time. What these researchers did was to say what are the outcomes of type 1 trauma, type 2 trauma, and type 3 trauma? For type 1 trauma, a single incident, they say well there's a full detailed memory you have a really bad day, chances are you can report it in a narrative way. Yes, I came out of my house, the guy across the street pulled the gun, he shot the guy in front of me, it's a coherent event. And the f other thing they find is post-traumatic stress disorder. Or, you know, I would say they find the challenge of post-traumatic stress de development. If you have multiple incidents, if you have type 2 trauma, the first thing that goes is a reliably narrative account of the event. Because inevitably the events become confused. You know, was, was the guy wearing a red hat the first shooting I saw or was that the second shooting I saw? And the prolonged arousal disrupts your memory processes about it. And the second thing you find is post-traumatic stress development, as I'm calling it. But in addition, they found superficial relationships, interpersonal distrust, feelings of shame, dependency that if you experience chronic trauma, it has an impact on your relationships, on your, your trust, your feeling of self-worth. Remember President Bush tried to say this once in public and he got tongue tangled. What he, what he was trying to say was, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, and he said, shame on you again. <laughs> but the real expression is, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And that's what type 2 trauma is partly about. That after you've been multiply traumatized, you say, wait a minute. One, you say, huh, I'm going to be very vigilant now because there's a lot of people out there going to hurt me. But two, you say, what is wrong with me that this keeps happening to me? You internalize the sense of being a loser. That's type 2 trauma. But type 3 trauma, which is the experience that is so common in the guys that I interview on death row, First thing is, you don't get the narrative memory. In part because that whole first four or five years of life run together dramatically. And the events are not discrete separable. Also, you're having a frontal assault on the capacity to provide narrative account generally by the assault on your brain or the assault on your consciousness. And you get your PTSD. We always get PTSD. But listen to what else you get. Denial. Repression. Emotional numbing, poor self-esteem and self-concept, interpersonal distrust, superficial relationships, high anxiety, chronic depression, suicidality, feelings of shame, foreshortened sense of the future, rage, emotional dysregulation, self-injury, eating disturbances, substance abuse, narcissism, impulsivity, identity confusion, and dissociative symptoms, disconnecting. Almost everything that could be problematic is found with type 3 trauma. Except the ability to be perceived as a victim. Because you can't tell a narrative account of your story. It takes me a long time when I sit with guys on death row to get this story 
usually we require records from others and others' reports because they don't have access to it. It is a central fact in their life, but they don't have access to it. Let me just pick out a couple. Narcissism. Narcissism is that inflated sense of self, that grandiose sense of self, which people generally hate in others. If you want to say how much they hate it, there are websites devoted to jokes devoted to narcissism. My favorite one is the woman who wrote in, my husband and I divorced for religious reasons. He thought he was God and I didn't. <laughs> that captures the message and the flavor. Why should narcissism be a product of type 3 trauma? Because there are two pathways to narcissism. One is what we usually think of. You know, college girls who, whose parents dote on them and as a result they get this bloated sense of self-importance. So they're always checking their, their Facebook page to see if their 11,000 friends have kept track of their status update. But if you look at the work of Wendy Bahari, there's another pathway to narcissism, probably more important and certainly more worthy of our human understanding, and that is narcissism as an overcompensation for feelings of inadequacy and self-worth. Which Americans are most attacked by violence and trauma and unrecognized trauma and violence? The young man who spoke before spoke for them. Young African-American males. Because of the legacy and the current reality of racism, because of the prevalence of trauma, because of the culture of honor that African-Americans inher inherited from white Southerners that says if somebody disrespects you, that is such a threat to your integrity, you have to respond with violence? What group in America has the ha average highest levels of narcissism scores? It's not, it isn't white college student girls. It's young African-American males. And they sure didn't get it because of being spoiled. They got it as overcompensation for dealing with trauma and racism. So when we talk about a trauma-informed community, a trauma-informed social service, criminal justice system, we always have to come back to Goethe. What is most difficult? That which you think is easiest, to see what is right before your eyes. Thank you. So now, uh, I hope I'm going to bring uh, a little bit of uh, basic science to this. I've been asked to talk about uh, the work that I've been doing for the past 21 years on how the environment affects the genome and the epigenome, how it affects the brain, and how it ultimately affects behavior. Much of what I'm going to say will come off in a very sort of forest gumpy way. Sometimes uh, chocolate's just a chocolate. Almost everything that we've worked towards is to prove the very simple hypothesis that all of us are related at a genetic level. In fact, 99.9% .9 of all of our genomes in this room are identical. And it's but for the grace of God, the genes we're given, and the environments that we're exposed to that either puts us at risk for negative outcomes or protects us from the things that we all suffer from. I'm going to take you to that point because often Policymakers need pictures and policymakers need an argument in order to make the right decision. And what you're going to hear from me, the end game of all of the science we've been doing is the best way to help a child is to help his family, and the best way to help his family is to help his community. And this child-centric way of helping a child in trouble simply doesn't work. It's illogical, it's repugnant, and it has to change. And I'm going to try to win that argument with science. I have appointments in the Netherlands where we've been following 10,000 babies since 12 weeks in utero. They're now about to be age 10. We're going to image their brains, heart, lungs, and guts this year to show that the same adverse experiences that would lead you to be naughty lead you to have diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. 
I'll talk to you about the 100,000 twins, 50,000 pairs we've been following in Amsterdam with Doret Bumsma. I'll talk to you about the work that we're doing at our trauma camp and our imaging work. My work is pretty simple. I want to study how the environment turns on and turns off genes you may have and how that phenomena puts you at risk for or protects you from changes in your behavior and those changes dictate the arc of your life. I believe that all medicine, all health comes from emotional behavioral health. The reason we eat well or not, drink well or not, smoke cigarettes, use drugs or not, strike our children or not, neglect our children or not, are all emotional behavioral decisions and that until our country can get out from under the shame of dealing with their own emotional behavioral problems, we're never going to be able to get by the number one cause of morbidity and mortality, which is emotional behavioral problems. And I'd like to say that physicians are the worst at, about it. We live in an era where we now routinely inoculate 10-year-old little boys and little girls against sexually transmitted viruses that may someday cause cervical cancer and yet we can't ask moms and dads if their childs are anxious, inattentive, sad, naughty, and we won't ask moms or dads the same. I stand in front of you as an inattentive, anxious man. It's not hurt me too bad. And I think it's a time where every American needs to be screened for his or her emotional behavioral health so that we can help moms and dads, help their kids, help their communities. I'm going to ask that you all suspend Incredulity when I say one path to that is mindfulness. If I train a child as you see in music, I'll change his brain. It's time to change, train children to be mindful and in so doing change their brains. I'll show you evidence of that. We followed 100,000 twins from birth and one of the first things we found, and I'm one of the co-authors of the dsm 4 I spent 21 years trying to get that stain off of me. It makes no sense to say an individual is depressed or not, anxious or not, inattentive or not, because all of us in this room are a little bit anxious, a little bit sad, a little bit naughty, and a little bit bad. So I moved to the University of Vermont to work with a, a really Copernican genius, Tom Achenbach, who developed a taxonomy that's normed by age, by gender, by ethnicity, that allows us to be measured by just the degree to which we express a trait. I've written many unreadable papers on this topic. <laughs> but I tested in 100,000 twins, comparing monozygotic to dizygotic twins, allowing me to test the degree to which these traits might be influenced by genes and by environments. This is called the Child Behavior Checklist. I don't have a pointer, or maybe I do. We've published genetic papers on every single one of these syndromes, anxious depression, withdrawn behavior, thought problems, social problems, attention problems, rule breaking and aggressive behaviors. And one thing you'll notice here, a kid is not one of these things, a kid is all of these things. But in the same way a kid gets your eye color, hair color, body height and weight from mom or dad, they get their attention, their aggression and their anxious depression from mom or dad. We measured these quantitative traits and I'm going to just present three for time. When we looked at naughty little Bobby, and you all know who these little kids are, they argue, they like to scrap. We followed 30,000 twin pairs, and what we found is no matter whether you're 3 to 12, 50 to 70 percent of the influence on aggression is due to genes, but the other 40 to 30 percent is due to the environment. And we said aggression is a good thing. You want your kids to be able to do well, to get to the limits of their capacity. It's the environmental storm around those aggressive genes that take it to the spot that people suffer. A female version of myself, these little ones can't pay attention, can't concentrate. Again, published on 30,000 twin pairs, we've shown 70 percent of the time influence on attention problems is genetic, but 30 percent of the time the environment is what influences those genes to go south or north. I'm forever grateful to my mom who raised myself and my siblings in adversity that the environment she brought me up in protected my attention problems and allowed them to go north rather than south. Anxious me, 30,000 twin pairs followed all the way to adulthood and again what we found red genes matter for 70, 60, 50, 50 percent of the, uh, the influence but environment matters more. I'm not going to change your genes but I can change your environment. 
from our work and many, many others. Every human behavior is influenced by genes, but the environments those genes sit in and their interaction. We've shown that moms and dads of little kids who are anxious, sad, and bad will have adult versions of anxious, sadness, and badness, and that kid who's being raised in that house, even though he's two or three, as Dr. Coles will said, universal daycare, if he looks fine, but mom is sad and dad's beating mom, that child's at two kinds of risk the genetic risk that he carries, but the environment that foments that change. This is what led us to say it's time to work on the environment, but what would be the organ for all these things? Well, it would have to be the human brain. Because if I'm going to argue to all of you that you can all be a little bit inattentive, a little bit aggressive, a little bit naughty, then I should be able to show you the regions in the human brain where inattention, naughtiness, and anxious depression lives. So what we did is we started thinking of the human brain this is white matter, gray matter, intrauterine development. You can see it about 30 weeks. The human brain looks like Play-Doh. It's lis and cephalic. And then with the explosion of gerification at 32 weeks, you can see the brain become the beautiful organ that we all love. The most dangerous thing you can do to a brain undergoing gerification is expose it to alcohol. The most dangerous time to do that is in the late in the third trimester. For years in this country, physicians said, oh, you're in your third trimester, have a drink. Zero tolerance. Everybody in our community needs to know this. This is the development of a human brain from age 8 to 16. I hope that's not going to run. That's very disappointing. What you'll see is the human brain undergoes incredible architectural rearrangement from age 4 to 22 with the cerebellum, temporal, frontal, and parietal lobe going through rapid reorganization. Imagine all of these things being under genetic control and then introducing trauma abuse, neglect, sexual violence, those children's brains will end up being different. So we started looking at brains. We studied kids who didn't have emotional behavioral problems. We made sure in these 500 images that these kids didn't have ADD, didn't have depression, didn't have conduct disorder. Because my theory was we should all have our aggression in the same area of the brain. Do you all understand that? Just like our heart is pumps, Parts of our brain pump aggression, parts of our brain pump anxiety. So I did a very simple thing with my colleagues at McGill. I said, I'll measure the outside of the brain, and then I'll measure the inside of the gray matter, white matter interface. That's called the cortical ribbon. Your cortex determines your behavior, your personality, your IQ, and everything you do. And then all I did is I regressed one symptom of aggression to two, to three, to four, to five, to six, to seven, to eight, to nine, to see which areas of the brain change. It's really very simple. And what we found was something stunning. We went back and looked at little Bobby and published in one of our best journals, the thinner your anterior cingulate is, the more aggressive you are. These kids don't have conduct disorder. You all know this area of the brain because of the famous story of Phineas Gage, this lovely boy man who was walking down the tracks and a railroad spike went right through his anterior cingulate and he became a psychopath. He was fine before he cut this region of the brain. These exact same regions are being called out by the experts in the world who say, I know where antisocial personality disorder lives, same region. I know where psychopathology lives, same reason. I know where conduct disorder lives, same region. Uh-uh. That's the region where all of our aggression lives. And it's the environment that those kids came up in that took them to psychopathy, conduct, and, and uh, antisocial personality disorder. Not that region of the brain. That brain region we've shown can change by reading. How many of these kids are read to 45 minutes a night? I'll show you that in a second. Anxious depression. People who study severe melancholic depression identified the anterior cingulate as a region of interest. We showed that same region is the region that drives anxious depression in little kids who don't have anxiety disorders. One symptom, two symptoms, three symptoms. And by the way, again, the, ex the experts on antisocial criminals say it's that same region of the brain that drives you to become antisocial. Now, this is a region of the brain that makes you nervous. Fight or flight? Some of us had to fight because we couldn't flee. Attention problems. Multiple studies of ADHD show ADHD kids' brains are too fluffy. They're not organized. We studied it in kids who don't have ADHD and showed the same regions of the brain that are too fluffy and not organized are true in little kids who have five and six and seven and eight symptoms of ADHD but don't have ADD. You'll hear later, if I don't run out of time, 
I'm showing you how violin training can increase the cortical organization in that region of the brain. But again, the experts say this is a region of the brain for antisocial personality disorder and murder. It's not. Those regions respond to the environment that they grow in, and if that environment is protective and health-promoting and mindful, hold on. We've published so many papers on all these behaviors, no one reads them, so for the sake of time, I'll continue to move on. <laughs> now, I keep saying the environment affects the brain. So how do we do it? Christina talked beautifully about adverse events, but how does adverse events affect the brain? Because remember, these are by definition preventable. I know it's Valhalla and we probably would have a tough time pulling this off. So let's look and see how these things change. How does adversity lead to negative outcomes through the brain? All of you know abuse, family strife, emotional neglect, harsh discipline lead to the adult outcomes of depression, drug abuse, and anxiety. Dr. Bloom and I can say we were kind of surprised that the great studies in adult medicine found out it was the same factors that lead to hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And how come the research wasn't going on together? Because if you want to prevent obesity, diabetes, hypertension, you should be protecting the things that put little children at risk. This is what our legislature need to know. Because they want to save money on adults. They don't care about kids. They flat out don't care about kids. Health care reform is about adults. If we help the children of these at-risk parents, we'll get the parents better. Let's do it in a family-based way. How does it work mechanistically? It's epigenetics, post-genetic modification. Remember, you're born with A, C, Gs, and Ts, 2.7 million of those. A always goes with T, C always goes with G, and there's a little phosphate zone that makes the alpha helix. You know all this. <laughs> I mean, wasn't God kind? She said all you need to know is A, T, C, and G. Now, the C always goes with G, the phosphate connects it. If you put a carbon with three hydrogens, a methyl group, on that CPG island, it shuts down those beautiful genes you might have. It's like throwing tree trunks on a train track. The track looks the same, but it can't run because it's blocked. This is called post-genetic modification. It's how the environment can turn genes off. So there's your little tree trunk on this beautiful track. It's called methylation. It silences gene expression. I'll show you how to better understand it. These two are identical twins. 100% of their DNA is the same. Their train track looks the same. They were separated at birth. Their DNA tells you why they look so much alike. Even the, how their little pinky fingers dangle off the end of the beer can. They actually married a woman with the same la first name. They started talking to each other to make sure it wasn't the same woman, but it turned, it turned out not to be. Now their epigenetics tell you why they're different. Which one of these fellows was raised in adversity? I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Humans are a conservative organism. We're going to turn off those satiety genes. Then you get old enough to eat all you want. You don't know you've had enough. Mike Meany won the Jakob Krauss Award for this gorgeous work looking at mouse models of stress reactivity. He found two kinds of mice in nature, low licking, grooming moms, moms who laid flat and their pups had to get to their breast to take milk. And he found high, arch-back, licking, grooming moms who licked and groomed and licked and groomed and licked and groomed their pups. They weren't genetic defects. These were just people who lived in, excuse me, mice who lived in nature. <laughs> and what he found is if you were li licked and groomed as a baby, you could deal with stress and you weren't fearful. But if you weren't taken care of, you were highly stressed out and very fearful. I hope you haven't eaten recently. There's a high arch-back, licking, grooming mom. Uh, this computer doesn't run quick time. You would have seen this mouse lick and groom and lick and groom and lick and groom. And this, her first baby, does perfectly on stress test, and the baby of a low licking grooming mom does terribly. Now, what Michael showed at sacrifice, high licking grooming moms had all the stress receptors they need. Their corticosteroid systems, which are tied to hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, were perfectly well controlled. The low licking grooming moms, you can see with your own eyes in the hippocampus, they have almost none of those receptors. They have circulating steroids and are at risk for all these medical outcomes. Please remember that hippocampus. Then Mike did the most amazing thing. At birth, he took the babies of a high-licking grooming mom and gave them to low-licking grooming moms and vice versa and completely reversed all the behavioral outcomes, completely reversed all the neuropathologic outcomes, completely reversed all the epigenetic outcomes. So a pup from a low-licking grooming mom raised by a high-licking grooming mom did perfectly. It had nothing to do with genetics, and it had everything to do with environment. 
Mike then took it to human beings and won a major award that showed that same receptor is the receptor that shut down in people who suicide. I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I can't deal with stress anymore, and ultimately the trigger's pulled. This is Mike giving the Dalai Lama a Team Canada hockey jersey. I checked this in adolescence. Everyone's deeply concerned, as am I, about the arc of the age period zero to three. But it turns out if you're abused in adolescence, the toxicity on those same receptors is even higher than when you're abused zero to three. And I call upon all of you, please don't forget our adolescence. In our focus to take care of zero to three, just remember that our adolescents and the storm of androgens are even more vulnerable than those zero to three children we so much want to protect. I then, with my colleague Joan Kaufman, a wonderful researcher at Yale, looked at the effects of abuse and trauma on the epigenome of, of children in DCF custody versus children in normal homes, and we found key genes responsible for the repair of brain injuries are turned off in traumatized children. In fact, the TPP methylation gene, the more it's turned off, the smaller the brains of abused children. This is my camp. Every summer I rent a little camp in Vermont. We bring a hundred traumatized children. This again with my colleague Joan, Trump, Joan Kaufman. I cook 2,500 meals for these kids. We do Tai Chi and mindfulness every day. We do paddle boarding, make music, but also at camp. Well, here's some of the other things we do. We get DNA and RNA. 21 neuropsychometric batteries. We get EEGs, structural and functional MRIs. I thought this is the right way to do research with children who've been traumatized, not bring them to a scary hospital and make them revisit all these things. And we found some extraordinary things and I'm going to do 100 more this summer and I'm already working on my menu. Now what happens if you're traumatized and you're a little girl? The higher your trauma score, the smaller your overall brain volume. This is in the kids, the 160 kids we've already just studied in this brand new study. We showed that girls who are abused, the right middle gyrus and the right anterior insulin, the more traumatized you are, the smaller these regions of the brain are. These are those emotional regulatory reasons of emotional reactivity, not taking care of yourself. And remember that hippocampus that was small and that little mouse that didn't get licked and groomed? If you're abused and you're a girl, your hippocampus is statistically smaller, almost linearly related to how abused you've been. But those are girls. Why would there be a difference between boys and girls when their trauma scores were almost the same? Lo and behold, the boys, remember that violent region where aggression is? The more a boy was traumatized, the thinner that region was. And this was really shocking because this is why we're going to go out, we're going to fight, we're going to get busy, right? Why were boys' and girls' brains different? The girls' scores were all, they were being sexually abused, and the boys' trauma scores were outside the house, going in the neighborhood and getting into the stuff. So we have a bi-kind of trauma, bi-region of interest in the brain, by uh, neurobiologic findings. I want to teeter the totter. All of you now are grimly aware when negative things happen to a kid, negative outcomes often follow. My science is then reductionistic. What if we did nice things for the kids? wouldn't nice things follow. My colleagues started calling this my Dr. Phil era of research. <laughs> Instead of just measuring illness, I wanted to measure wellness. I wrote impossibly to read papers on resilience and genetically informative designs, and was so motivated by that success, I wrote an impossible to read book on the same topic. But what did we show? We showed four Violin lessons increases your um, right precentral gyrus, corpus callosum, and heschel gyrus size. If I put a five pound dumbbell in my hand and lift it, my biceps will be this big 10, 20, 30. My biceps gets bigger. You all understand that all I changed was my environment. If I change the environment a little kid's life by putting a violin in his hand, I'm building a bigger bicep in his brain. And where is it being built? In the emotional regulatory regions of the brain. Piano does the same thing. The more you practice, the larger internal capsule and corpus callosum allowing cross-hemispheric communication. So I started thinking about this. I said, I've studied ADD, I've studied aggression, I've studied nastiness, I'm going to study music. Remember I showed you ADD guys, their brains were too big and too fluffy? The DLPFC, which others say is one of the murder regions of the brain. This paper recently published by my, my group showed the more violin training you had, the more cortically organized those regions of the brain are. 
Kind of a stunning change. Don't you think every kid deserves someone to have a catch with him? Every girl deserves a chance to play music, to be mindful, to read books. And yet the vast minority of children in our country right now have daily access to these activities. Singing improves your brain at a genetic level. And the worse singer you are, the more powerful it is. <laughs> this is an extraordinarily important scientific moment for all of us. Because in our country, only gifted athletes compete, only gifted musicians play, only gifted singers sing. That's following your genome. That's not going to help you as an individual. What we want you to do is challenge your epigenome. Find things the kids aren't good at and have them do that. Turn on those genes, build those brains, change the arc of their outcome. We created the Dutch Health Behavior Questionnaire where we measured all these things. And the most powerful thing you could do for a little girl is put her on a sports team. At a genomic level, she was protected from all of these outcomes. You can see in the Netherlands, 70% of 13-year-olds were on sports teams. At age 15, it drops to 40%. At age 18, it drops to 15% with an explosion of body mass index, psychopathology, and drug abuse problems. Same is true for boys. Every child should be able to compete and benefit from living a goal-directed behavior as a member of a team. Still separate the elite athletes, because kids are pragmatic, and if they're on a pitch with somebody who's extraordinary, they'll think they're not good. But you get rid of the most excellent, and everyone else is equally awful, and they get all the benefits of being a member of a team. When muggle children read, they're less aggressive. After every Harry Potter novel was published in the United Kingdom, there was a massive reduction in emergency room visits for childhood violence and aggression. So we tested that in our twin design, and we showed the most powerful way to reduce aggression in a genetically correlated way was to read to them. In our program, every kid is read to 45 minutes a night before he's allowed to turn on anything electronic. So what do we do about this? We created the Vermont family-based approach. We argue that every family, whether they're well at risk or affected, deserves a family wellness coach. Please raise your hand if you've been trained in parent training. Very small group, and yet you heard the great author speak today about wanting universal pre-K with parent training. Thousands of articles, the most powerful way to reduce conduct disorder, oppositional defined disorder, and negative child outcomes is parent training. Our family wellness coaches train everybody because we think with careful screening we can identify the strengths and weaknesses of moms and dads, of families, whether mom is there, whether dad is there, whether grandma's raising the kid or grandpa. We then tailor health promotion and prevention. Think of this little girl with anxious depression and ADD. What's happened in our country, which is repugnant, is the vast majority of the time she's given Ritalin and Zoloft. My own work shows if she's got ADD, don't be surprised to see her mom or dad has ADD. If she's anxious, don't be surprised to see mom or dad's anxious. Her ADD anxiety makes them worried. Mom's worry makes dad more upset. Dad's irritability upsets mom, which upsets the boys, which upsets everybody. The akuna matata of life in our country. And no one here would think a dose of Ritalin would do anything in that model. So what we say, everybody should have a coach to teach them about mindfulness, about music, about reading, about exercise, about peer support, about nutrition and effective parenting. We have Barry White nights. We make mom and dad go out on a date and not talk about their kids. Try doing that sometime. Focus family coach says to mom, Dad, your child has a highly heritable and treatable emotional behavioral problem. You might be struggling against the yoke of your own. Let us help you help your kids because surely you know the best thing for your child is to have you as healthy and centered as you can be. We have multiple of these programs going on around the country. I know I'm out of times and I'm out of breath, but you should know. I tested and developed the Vermont family-based approach in the ghettos of St. Louis from 1986 to 1993. And one of my favorite criticisms of this work is I wonder how it would work in an inner city. It was developed in an inner city. I advocate for global screening of all of us. We should know our emotional behavioral strengths, we should know our weaknesses, and we should get coached up. We should advocate for brain, advocate for brain health promotion for all. In the same way a cardiologist doesn't define him or herself by just treating people with end-stage heart disease, it's time for people who care about kids to care about all kids, because if we promote 
health universally, as Mr. Causal asked for, everybody gets better. And in the end, take a family-based, community-based approach. Thank you. Okay, we actually have a few minutes for questions. Um, okay, so where are they meant to be up here or over here? I'm not sure. So if we get one up here, that would be great. And if not, should we allow? We have one minute. One minute, okay. So if, there, if there's one quick question, People would like to pose because otherwise we will move into uh, the break. One question over to the left. About, I hear about all this wonderful work with parents and so forth. What's being done with foster parents to take children out of the system that are dealing with trauma and the foster care system getting more trauma support for the thousands of kids that have experienced trauma and have never been screened for it. I, I'm working really, oh, oh. <laughs> this is a, it's a, a spectacular question and it has to do not only with foster care and DCF but the juvenile justice system as well. Why in the world when children experience these kinds of uh, traumas in their life, they're separated from mom and dad, Nothing's done for the biological parents who've lost their child and are essentially told they're incompetent. The child then goes to another setting where his or her health is not being promoted. And then often the child is reunited with the family who's already been told they're incompetent to raise a kid. It's repugnant, has to stop. The bill I mentioned in Vermont is to take all DCF families and, and give them the benefit of this approach. That don't punish a family, but say life is hard in 2015. You were never given the skills because of this cycle of trauma and this cycle of poverty. Let us start now. And the same with juvenile justice system. Don't put a child in jail. Give his family help. Thank you all. Thank you for an incredibly stimulating panel.